Um, next up is Mike Walsh. I just need you to turn the mic. Yeah. Yep, thanks. Thanks, Mayor Patterson, Deputy Mayor McDonald, and councillors. Thanks for the opportunity to address the administration report on Southeast Leamington. I am a permanent resident of Southeast Leamington at 220 East Beach Road. The residents and farmers of Southeast Leamington joined together to form EMRA, the East Mercia Ratepayers Association, in about 2005. Our association went into abeyance five years ago when Leamington Council decided to maintain existing land uses and to reject the proposition from IRCA that existing land uses are no longer sustainable. So it is with surprise and dismay that we are facing the same questions again that we thought had been put to rest in 2010. Questions that had taken years of deliberation hundreds of thousands of dollars of research costs and much sweat and tears of the ratepayers and councillors and Dave Van Kesteren and Point Pelee National Park representatives and IRCA representatives and the many meetings of the Southeast Leamington uh, Ratepayers Association which was formed by council at the time. Now, there's a number of new councillors who were not involved in the earlier decision and deserve to be brought up to date. And I reiterate John Lanchute's uh, comments that you just heard. I'm sure the administration report is designed to do that. However, we are surprised that the decisions made five years ago are apparently back on the table for further debate. Council in 2010 knew that senior levels of government were keen to financially support naturalization projects but not provide funds for continued use of the land for farming and shoreline residences. The language of the Baird report and numerous IRCA reports maintain that naturalization options are sustainable, agriculture and residences are not. Let me suggest to you that on the evidence currently before us, the farming areas and the shoreline residences have not changed since 2010. They have been maintained. They've been sustained, if you like. My property, which I have owned since 1979, uh, put, I mean, we put in a permanent home there in 2001, has been protected from wave attack by the armor stone wall installed in 1973. There hasn't been an inch of lost shoreline wherever the armor stone wall is in place. And it basically guarantees that you may get some splash over, you may even get some sand over, but you don't get your property washed away. We wouldn't have built in 2001, knowing the lake as far back as the early 1970s, without that protection being there in place. The same cannot be said for the natural areas of Hillman Marsh and Point Pelee National Park. In both of these locations, the shoreline has been seriously eroded. This is partly because the natural protective mechanism of sand deposition has been destroyed. Firstly, by sand mining of billions of tons of offshore sand in the 1950s and 1960s. Cleveland was built by the sand dragged out of Lake Erie. And secondly, by the interruption of natural sand flows by the construction of Wheatley Harbour and Leamington Harbour. With natural protection gone and no protective actions taken, the storm waves have wrecked havoc on Hillman Barrier Beach and, and the east side of Pele National Park. And the lack of protection, protective action in both those cases has increased the risk of damage to shoreline property owners at Hillman and has d damaged the Marantit Dyke at where it's adjacent to the Point Pelee National Park. Now, Urca and the Baird Report agree that major capital works in excess of $100 million 
are required to establish the natural area in place of the existing uses. Now that's three times the value that the existing uses require to, to stay in, in effect. On the basis that the only sustainable use is the natural area and the federal and provincial governments will only support a sustainable future. At current rates of erosion, there will be little left to sustain in the natural areas that currently exist by the time they get around to doing something. The capital bill for maintaining current land, land uses in Rob Sharon's report approximates 35 million plus. As long as the shoreline protection is maintained and capital works are done, there is no reason to believe that farming and shoreline residents can't be sustained for the long term. Ask the Dutch who work on their farms all below the level of the North Sea, not just freshwater Lake Erie. With regard to the options presented in the report, well, really, I don't think I should be addressing them because I'm hoping that Council won't be addressing them uh, at this, this time e either. We had lengthy debates. What we really need is and I, I would remind Council that at the time in 2010 when they took the decision, they didn't go with the administration's report, which basically said go with the naturalization of the area because the big governments are going to come up with the bucks to pay for it, whereas they won't come up with the bucks to pay for it if it's farmers and residences. And what we need is for administration to accept the decision that was taken by Council in 2010 and go out there and spruik for farming and residents and the maintain maintenance of those two land uses in the area and go to the senior governments and maintain that in fact these land uses, if, if we want them to be, can be sustained forever. The, war, the woman in 1973, it has held back Lake Erie for all the time until now, more than 40 years, well beyond, beyond its design life. It's the maintenance of that and getting the natural areas to do their job of, of maintaining their land that should be the primary focuses of, of the, the council and the administration. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Questions from Council? None? Okay. Thank you very much. And last uh, uh, delegation is Tom Dick. Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, Tom Dick, 1110 Road 20, or Mercy Road 1. Anyways, uh, after what he just said, he pretty well summed it all up in a nutshell, you know, and can we afford it? None of us, we, we can't. And if you guys ever do push that on us, we'll be coming to live with you because we ain't got no money. <laughs> You're the fate. But anyways, if it's possible, uh, just go back. And uh, I noticed you had in this report, you had got legal, legal advice from someone. Peter, something about, you mentioned about legal advice. What was that all about? Was that about liability, or what's this all about? If you remember the last time we were at this point, yeah. when probably previous council, um, and we were trying to get to the second or second reading of that motion, okay. um, we just wanted to make sure, and this all it's ever been about is to make sure that the rest of the municipality is not going to be held liable should right. that dike break and flood all of you out. Right. And that's where we wanted to know, are we making the right decisions by taking the stance that we have? Okay. And if you recall, I think it was 2014, uh, Mr. Van Kastren got the Minister of Environment down. He came down, he met with us at Freddy's, we talked. He said, guys, it's just like what happened in, when your east, east side eroded there, when the cottages were washed into the dikes in 73. He said, what do we do? Came with emergency funding. 90% was covered by the government. 10% was covered by the people. And he said, you know what? Doesn't matter who's in government. It'll still carry to this day. So leave us, let us be. Let us do our farming. Let us do live our lives. And let us continue on. You know, that's all I ask. Okay. Any questions from council? 
No? Okay. Deputy Mayor. Well, Tom, I'm getting two messages here, though. Because John Landshut and Mike are saying, you know, we need to help out. The people that are calling us after the north wind and the east wind comes, they're calling us and saying you have to help us. And you're telling us, leave us alone. Well, and well, let me finish here. Okay. And that's what it was in 2010. The majority said, leave us alone. And that's what we did. Right. But now when the weather starts, we're getting the phone calls. And when we drive down there after the waters come over on those unprotected properties, we had the road closed for how many days? We're exactly unprotected. Well, now I'm talking by Wheatley. Well, this is Wheatley, all of South right. Lee, okay, Southeast. Okay, but that's, that doesn't, that's not our area, correct? That's but, like Cottery Park. And the problem right. is, you know what? And like they said, like John said about Urca, you know, taking care of their area, that, that is a vital thing. You know, I mean, here they're supposed to be conservationists, and what are they doing? They're letting the whole shoreline go, and they're going to let the marsh go eventually. But those are the two key players, uh, Urca and the Point. And right. neither, neither of which we have any control over. We've sat and we've talked to Richard Wyma. We've talked to people from the point. They're not willing to do that. So we're, the municipality, in my, to my way of thinking, is between a hard, rock and a hard place. Yes, those are the places that should be fortified. Are they going to do it? No way. Too much money. So then how do we keep throwing... And that's with us, too much money too. Oh, to, and, and totally... You know. That's why we wanted that study. We wanted to know exactly what kind of dollars we were talking about, if it was even possibly feasible. We know it's not feasible. Right. I think we're going to have to make some long and short term plans so that we're not so that John Landshut and, and his heirs <laughs> don't keep coming back for the next fifty years. We're going to have to map out a plan. I don't think we have any choice anymore. The weather keeps getting extreme it used to be the one in 100 year storms heck those one are in one five. in five yep, I agree. so so to ignore this to keep ignoring this i don't believe that we can i think we have to have a uh, plan okay you're talking about you said down by cottery park and that i agree you know there are issues there but have we been had any you know any, any danger in south in our area in east marsh i don't feel we've had any danger there whatsoever i feel none whatsoever danger there and I feel you know like you know the dikes along a lot of my land and I, I'm fair, I feel it's all sustainable there I'm not worried about that dike time I am going to worry is probably if Erica doesn't take care of their shoreline then we're going to have issues you know well if I may Mr. Mayor I think I think you better consider that that's exactly what's going to happen and and yet I'm also looking at those properties that aren't protected the ones that don't have houses on them I look I drove down there a couple times and saw where the the, the sand and everything's washed up over the road. That's Look down at the Hillman Beach, the former beach, if you right, will. Right, yeah. And there's I, nothing I, left. But there's nothing left, and there's few homeowners that did not put rock ac across their property by Mr. Clifford's there. And there, yeah, I, there, is, there is an issue there, but, but that's, that's his, uh, his issue on his property. It was his, you know, his uncle's prerogative. He didn't, didn't want it. So my thing is just... Can you not go after Urca? I mean, if they're going to destroy our destroy our dike, is Urca not responsible? It's their marsh. What are they? What is, what is their job? What's we have, Urca? We have time and time and time again. As long as you guys have been fighting it, as long as we've been on council, we've been fighting for that same thing. I don't I don't understand why they can't. So they're real do good stewards. You know what I mean for conservation. <laughs> okay. It is. Councillor Jacobs. Thank you, Worship. Uh, as John was saying there, yeah, we've been through this for the last five, six years, uh, still the same thing. And, uh, you know, I, we went down, we looked at all that stuff. Remember, they want to put this thing up, what, 15 feet in the air and all this other kind of stuff. And the cost, you're absolutely right, is uh, it's unattainable. Neither the municipality nor the landowners or anyone else can do that. And I have to agree with uh, Deputy Mayor McDonald. I think that our strategy has to be at this stage of the game that no one's interested in spending those kind of dollars. We can't afford it, and neither can you. But I think we need to do look at the maintenance of this, what we have, look after what we have, maintain it. And as Councillor McDonald's saying, or I'm sorry, Deputy Mayor McDonald's saying, look what we're going to do in the future, years down the road. 
So I think our option at this current stage of the game is strictly a maintenance program. Take care of what we have in place. And I think that would, is what you're looking for as well. That we do not need to spend millions and millions of dollars that no one can afford. So my recommendation at this stage of the game would be that we direct our administration to whatever way we can to look after the maintenance of this, those particular roads and areas that are in danger, and look at a long-range exit strategy on it. So, okay, but you're you're not putting a motion on the floor right at the moment because we have. No, I'm not looking at a motion currently. It's okay. just a recommendation that I'm making. Okay. Maybe the fellow councillors, I'm sure, are going to make some comments as well. But uh, you know, we've been at this the last five years that I've been sitting here. And, and this keeps coming up, and nobody can afford it. And we're not going to get funding. And as far as IRCA goes, well, that's a whole other animal. So, I, I'm going to ask um, Mr. Newfeld to explain why this report has been brought forward to council in this fashion. And that's that's a good question, because I think it's important that uh, the people who are here tonight and the people who are affected by this uh, understand that. We're, administration isn't trying to rehash this whole issue. What we have is we were given a direction uh, by council to move forward. Um, we, we moved forward to the Court of Revision. The Court of Revision listened to the landowners and, and said, well, we're not going to deal with this and brought it back to council uh, because the landowners, as, as many of you were there as well, said, um, leave us alone, we, don't, we can't afford it, we don't want you to move forward. The problem is that at this point, the only direction administration has been given is to go in the direction that led us to the Court of Revision. So what we're asking now is to say, listen, if we all understand that this is um, unattainable, that the money at the upper levels of government is not available, um, give us a direction to go and look at some long-term uh, strategies for dealing with this. And one of the strategies that we can deal with is to acknowledge that there, there is not uh, going to be development down there. Um, and what that will do, in, in part, what is... A, what we should probably also say is there will be some notice then given to uh, local lawyers and real estate agents that this is potentially, if, if that's the will of council, that we will make sure that there is uh, some sort of notice given that no more uh, development will be made in that area. We're not looking to force the changes. We're not looking we're not looking to uh, extract money from the landowners. We, we as administration, we as council, have heard that message, and we agree because we don't have the money to do this either. But it would be unethical for us as administration to explore any other option given the direction that we were given. So what this report is doing is saying, look, if, if you want to continue on in this direction, that's option A. Send it back to the Court of Revision and make them make a decision. But if you're not willing to go in that direction because it's not, uh, it's, it's not feasible, then give us another direction to start to explore longer range strategies on how, uh, how we can deal with this. Because to do otherwise, um, we would be acting outside of council's direction to us. We don't know what those long-term strategies are. We don't know what the mid-term strategies are or the short-term strategies, but we can't even consider those given the current direction. So this report, in essence, was to say to council, if we're all agreeing that we can't go in that direction, then at least rescind that direction so that council can then say to administration, have a look at our long-term strategies, in essence, what is our exit strategy out of this conundrum? That's, what, that's why we brought this report forward, is not to, not to move in any particular direction, but to say, we can't move in the direction you told us to, we all acknowledge it, rescind that, 
to allow us to look at other options. Councillor Hammond. <clears throat> Your Worship, thank you. Um, it was noted earlier that uh, there are two or three of us here, three of us that are new to council, and that's correct, and it's, it's a difficult issue. Um, I've had some conversation with Tom in the last few days. Uh, to try to get up to speed, I've met with Rob, and we've had a, a good sit-down session to try and make us better understand where we, where we come from. Tonight, I got a little bit of conflict when I heard that we need some more arbor stone, and I heard that, I believe, from you, Mike, that we need to put in some arbor stone along that east side to protect that. Um, and, Tom, I certainly heard what you said. Kind of leave us alone. It's difficult for me to sit here and think that uh, we would go against Council's wishes of five years ago. However, financially, it seems like it's impossible, uh, both to the, uh, to the landowners there and certainly to the municipality. And... Um, as new councillors, we will endeavour to try to, I think I speak for the other two, we will endeavour to try to get caught up to where this needs to be and, and to look at more or less what our CEO has said as well. Let's look at the long term, where we need to be, let's get in that direction and let's get, try to get a resolve one way or the other to where this needs to be. And that would be my commitment to you, to the landowners and the people that are there. Thank you. Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Worship. Um, to go back to what Peter was just saying a minute ago, uh, with option, we had three options presented to us tonight that you're looking for uh, direction on. Now, let's say option B was one of them. Could Mr. Jacobs' suggestion he just had a moment ago, that could fall within option B as well. There are, we're going to be looking at all sorts of different uh, scenarios, short-term, long-term, and Mr. Jacobs could very well be one of them, correct? Yes, uh, Mr. Hammond put it well for everybody out there. I think I've been reading this thing nonstop. It's the biggest one that I concentrated on here since I got my agenda on Thursday. Um, I'm trying to answer the first, uh, Mr. Uh, is it Longshoot? Longshoot. Landshoot. Yep. I'm trying to get to where you're asking, trying to figure out is this thing sustainable or unsustainable is what I think this is what is what administration is wanting us to come up with the answer for. And I don't want to duck that, uh, uh, our responsibility there. Mr. Hammond said it well, though. We uh, are new guys here, and we just got a report on Thursday night, and we're kind of trying to get caught up on matters going all the way back to 2007. That's a lot for us to uh, digest here in a short amount of time. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I want to hear the rest of the council what their opinion is, but that's where I'm trying to get to is making a judgment on whether this is sustainable or unsustainable. I kind of disagree with one thing you did say there, Mr. Landshut, that nothing has changed since 2004. I think the storms are getting worse, and I think the storms are only going to continue to get worse that batter our shorelines. In my short one year on council here, I've seen evidence of that a few times where uh, I didn't realize it was like that before I got onto council. That's one thing where I would disagree with you there. Um, I might comment some more here in the, after I hear a few more councillors speak. Any other speakers? None? I, I guess to, to those of you from Southeast Leamington, I really haven't changed my position. I think I've been standing on your side all along, keeping all of you down there the way you are. Um, the realities are, are coming to the forefront, though, and the costs that are involved here. So I don't know what else to do. Um, we can't leave you alone. I, I, I think that's just irresponsible. I, I, even if we said, yeah, let's take a look at the options down there, I'm not sure I'd change my position anyway. We, we have to figure out something. And even if we just look at the options and still come back to council and we say, yeah, no, that's not going to work. There, there are property owners down there that are being taxed as if their properties can be built on, and they cannot. If that's one change we made, then we've helped some people down there. I, I don't have the answers, so. Mr. Neufeld? I, I think it is interesting, though, and um, the, the different views of the same people who are living down there. Right? Um, Mr. Dick has, has talked about the barrier beach, and if that's fortified, then you won't have to worry about the wave action against the, 
the dike on road one. I understand that. But that's not the same issue that the other two are talking about. One's talking about Armourstone, one's talking about uh, getting the upper levels of government to bring money down here to fix the dikes and the dike systems. What I'm getting at is that this is a very complex situation and the, even the people who live in southeast Leamington aren't really focused on exactly the same issue um, when it comes to maintaining or fixing or putting money towards it. And I, get, I think all I'm trying to do is reiterate that's why administration is saying we have to take a step back, review what is our exit strategy for the, the conundrum that, that is faced by everybody down there. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think at first, well, 10 years ago, there was a, a bit of a gun to our heads, wasn't there, to get that um, Memorial Park developed down there. And I think that was the reason that a lot of us said, let's leave things the way they are. But we're now what, almost 10 years down the road, and we're really seeing that we're going to have to have a plan without that gun to our heads. And it might be a, a lot easier to develop something when there isn't an ulterior motive, because council is definitely an administration going to work with you to find a solution without an ultimate goal already in mind. So if we can sit at the table and again talk about the different options, listen to the people, we should be able to come up with a plan. I was one of the ones that said, leave things the way they are, but I really don't think that we can do that going into the future, John. I don't think we can, and we don't want you coming back in 10 years saying. If, if you come up to the microphone, Absolutely. I'll let you, just for one. To me, it comes back to the, to the, uh, to the, to the same mandate that we had 2004. If you could envision 50 years from now, all of the farmland is now converted back to wetlands and the erosion continues to happen. Do you believe that the federal government is, would allow a, natural, a national park, Hillman Marsh, where we're situated, and Point Pelee not to exist 50 years beyond that? Or would they come to the rescue of the park and put in armor stone, which is what we're asking for now? So you have to think in my long term. Opinion, in my opinion, yes, they would come Ex to the rescue. Exactly. Of that. So that's the issue here: is do nothing to make it non-sustainable for farming. The farmers, unfortunately, may have to exit. Maybe the best thing is to get expropriated, which is something that we talked about back in 2005, 2006. If you really want the land, as we all know, the government has the power to do whatever it wants to do to attain whatever it wants to attain. Let it be for highways, let it be for natural, natural parks, national parks, whatever it is. We realize that. So what we're saying, and I think that all of us are saying the, the exact same thing, we're saying leave us alone because we can't afford $35 million. No. But as Tom Dick said, and John Andrasik was very successful in doing that back in 1973, when the shoreline was really eroded, and we did have a flood action, and because of the flood flooding into the area that we now live in, the federal government came forward with 90% funding and put the armor stone in. So that's what we're, what we're saying now is federal government, basically you're either going to wait for it to become wetlands and then protect it, because you will protect it, or you can help us protect our homes and our farms as they exist today. That's the fundamental principle here, or, or the issue, I should say. A fundamental issue here is, would the federal government rather be saving a national park, or would the federal government rather be known to save a few of us small farmers and residential people? And what do you think the answer is? I know what the answer yeah. is. So when we talk about an exit strategy, right, and I hate to say it, is, you know what, if we really believe that there's no funding for us for any of this, and you guys have to do something, then let's be honest with the people that live in the area and do something that unfortunately is going to go back to the Smith Memorial wetland, right, at some point. So wouldn't it be better for you and I or you and council and all of you and council to have control over that exit strategy plan 
than to be shotgunned into it? I think for all of us, we would want to have our council and administration protect our well-being and go for the federal funding so that we can sustain our lives as they are today. Well, and we have been, and right. I will no, continue. But I know. So, so if you're saying to me, you know, throw in the towel, and here's the exit strategy to join the natural conservation area that was presented by the Beard Report 10 years ago, how wonderful is that? The reality is, is we love where we live. We're part of Lamington. I moved here in 1990, love to be here, raised my family here, right? Have no intention of leaving. But now we're saying the exit strategy is, the only option is, we may have to convert it to wetland in my lifetime, my two sons' lifetime, and maybe beyond. Yeah. I, I don't want to throw in the towel. I don't think that's what council is saying up here. I, I just want to be in control of what may come because I think you and I are saying the same thing that if it was or federal park and, and wetland, they would be here in a heartbeat to, break, to, to, to protect it. I can't get that support at provincial or federal level yet, so to protect us as I'm, we are. I mean, unfortunately, some of the, some of the original EMRA um, participants, Wayne Marantet, Jerry Demick and those people, you know, were very vocal for us. So that's what's going to happen eventually. All of us are going to get too old to defend it. Perhaps our family is going to say, Dad, you've been working with this for 20 years. We don't want to spend 20 years of our lifetime going to council mm -hmm. and trying to defend what may be inevitable, which is a conversion to wetland. I don't know. Yeah. But I, again, I think that's what administration is trying to say to us. Right now, we've made them like this, right? And so it had been saying, well, undo those cuffs. Let us look at the options, come back to council and make recommendations of what could be. And that would be with cons consultation with all of you instead of the, the other option where. Well, unfortunately, <clears throat> Erica um, tried to get all of us stakeholders involved at one time as well. We knew out of the gate that there was an overall mandate, they had an the overall agenda. objective. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So it was nice to sort of tag us along, humor us a little bit, but we knew what was going to happen. We knew that the Beard Report, the shoreline engineers of the world, whatever they might be known as, were going to come back with one recommendation, and that is it isn't sustainable long term. Nothing's changed in 10 years, yeah. unfortunately. Okay. And as far as Nothing's changed in 10 years. If you talk to the older residents, there's beach that was there. Three years ago, we had one meter lake level lower than we are today. So the lake does fluctuate quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Do I think that, that we're going to have a one in five year storm? Absolutely not. We've seen the lake go up and down, and, I, and, and I'm not that old yet, even though I'm 54. But if you talk to the older people, they seen sand beaches out there and they could swim out, and that's going to happen again. The reality is things go up and down, lake levels are going to go, you know, everybody's worried about a, um, a climate change and everything else. We don't have any glaciers feeding our, our Great Lakes that I'm aware of anyway, um, but it will definitely affect the oceans. Anyway, thank you. Mr. Neufeld? And the only thing that I wanted to raise is that uh, administration wanted, wants a chance to look at options. I don't think you saw anywhere in the report a recommendation to return this to wetlands. There is not that from administration, right? There is, sorry, but it doesn't, the administration is not recommending that within option two. What we're asking is to give us the opportunity to look at options. And the report does talk about public consultations. I don't think that there, it, I don't think it's a fair assessment to say that there is a preconceived end in mind, the return to the wetlands. Um, we, we just I, want I think that Mayor Patterson made it very clear, though, and I supported his comment. If this was a national park looking for $35 million, you would have a pretty big year. But because we're landowners, farmers, and residents, the ears aren't so big, unfortunately. So unfortunately, is that a preconceived notion or not? National park versus farmers and residents? Yeah, I think it is a little bit. Well, that would be your, your opinion. You're entitled to it. I'm well, telling you... No, it was the I'm, mayor that said that. And what I'm telling you is that administration right now can't even explore anything differently 
than what we were told a few years ago. And all we're asking for is to get a new direction so that we can maybe talk to the federal government about other options, whatever those options are. At this point, we can't even do that. So, does council understand that clearly enough? Because that, okay. Councillor Jacobs. Thank you, Worship. And listening to all this, no matter what we do, there's going to be a cost associated with this, whether we're going to run the maintenance programs or whatever. And I think that as our uh, CAO is, is saying that maybe at this stage of the game, we should maybe have, have them come back to us to say what is the best plan to move forward with here, like a maintenance program, what's the cost associated to the landowners as well as the municipality, exit programs, and so forth. Uh, you're, we have tied them because our, th our original mandate to administration is go get some money and they can't get it. So their hands are tied at this stage of the game. So where do we move forward? Nobody can afford what's, what's being presented. Nobody's going to spend $35, $50 million. It's, 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 it's not going to happen. So I think what we need to do at this stage of the game is say, what's it going to cost to maintain this? What's it going to be to the landowners for our drainage schemes and so forth that, that has to take place in that particular area? Come back to council with that and say, this is what the costs are. Is it acceptable to the landowners? Is it acceptable to us as well? And that's where I think we should go with this. I, I think we, we have to give some direction here somewhere. Okay, so if I can ask council then, there, like Mr. Sharon said, there is no recommendation here other than to provide council with information. Um, as much as I'm still stuck on my original stand on this property, I know we have to look around if we're going to get anywhere. So uh, option two seems to make the most sense to me at this point in time. So Deputy Mayor. Well, we're not going to do option one simply based on the fact that if we direct this to go to court of revision, then we'll move forward in the process of, of doing the, the work. And we're yeah. not going to do that no. because no one can afford it. And then option three, you're just receiving it, not going to do anything. Is that correct? Is until, that how would you translate that? Until we get upper levels of government. But really, option two is not a threat. It's, it's not a threat to the landowners. It's taking off the table the... Option one. Yes, the, the um, ability or the, the mm -hmm. proposal to fix the dike and assess the, the amounts due to the property owners, correct? And it's just saying that we'll, we'll rescind all that, get it off the table, and then we'll look towards working together to find short and long-term strategies. So it's not taking anything away. It's saying we're going to work together without outside sources does it at all, because I made a note, option two does not say anything about bringing in upper levels of government at any point in time. Is that something that we would do? Does that need to be in there? In option number two? In option number two. I would think that's going to be paramount. Absolutely. But it's not in there. Well, it, it, again, option number two in my mind, if I'm just reading between the lines, is just saying, let us find ways to make okay. something good happen down there. And if it means finally being able to convince the, the feds and the province to step forward and, and protect our farmers, then let's, I mean, I've been knocking my head against the wall trying to do that, but you know, I'm not quitting. And this gives admin the chance to do the same thing. Option two gives administration time to do the yeah. same thing. That's, that's why I'm leaning towards that. To me, that gives us a few more options. I'll make the motion then that we go with option two. We'll see where it goes. Supported by Councillor Jacobs. So, Mr. Land, um, I'm sorry, Walsh. <laughs> One quick rebuttal or comment. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I didn't make any comments about uh, option two because I was hoping that 
the whole thing would be taken off the table. But just in reference to option two, um, if you remember in concept E from the Baird report, the, the, the shoreline owners were kept and the farmers were gone except for the muck farmers. Now in this option two, there's a suggestion that the shoreline owners be gone and it only be, be farmers. That's one of the options in, one of the things in option number two. Um, so I'm suggesting to you that where you've got shoreline owners, you've got people concerned about the protection of their property, and so they make sure that there's shoreline protection. You take those shoreline owners out, and you'll have the situation that you've got right at Hillman Marsh, where there's a property that nobody can build on, so they don't care about it, they haven't protected it, and it's three quarters gone. So the shoreline owners are protection for all of the farms in, 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 uh, in between. If you take the shoreline owners out, that will be a cost that will fall on the municipality to, to be looking after the protection of. Yeah. And, I, and I would simply say to that, that anything that's in this report under option two, one or three, is, is merely just, it's not a plan. It's just conjecture that's out there. It's just, these are some of the possibilities we could consider type thing. So, Deputy Mayor? That's what I was going to say, Mike. It just says, as an example. So that's, we're still going to talk with you. You, you know our history's been that we've been engaged with the, stakeholders down there we've not turned our backs we've tried to listen to what you say we feel that we're being pushed into this to have some kind of a plan so this this is just an example and i wouldn't i wouldn't get twisted over that all right no further comments then i'll call the question on the motion was to go with option two okay any further discussion on that motion? All in favor of that motion. And carried. Thank you very much to the delegations for coming out tonight and everybody else. Okay, and we will work together. Next, um, next report is, oops. Appointment of an Integrity Commissioner, Ms. Orton. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is a report uh, regarding the recommendation to appoint an Integrity Commissioner for the Municipality of Leamington. Um, as Council is aware, and the public is aware as well, a municipality is accountable to the public as stakeholders for decision made, decisions made, policies implemented, as well as his action or inaction. And to maintain this accountability, municipal councils are responsible to put in place policies to ensure transparency and openness in its decision-making processes and to implement mechanisms to provide for consultation, participation, and involvement. So under part um, six of the Municipal Act, uh, it authorizes a municipality to establish a code of conduct for members of council. Uh, a written code of conduct helps to ensure that members share a common basis for conduct and it acts as a supplement to the declaration of office that a council member takes. Uh, the municipality passed a code of conduct in 2008 and I provided that code of conduct for your ease of reference. Uh, the Act also authorizes a municipality to appoint an integrity commissioner, and that person reports to council and is responsible for performing in an independent manner the function assigned to, functions assigned to him or her, and it's in respect to the application of the Code of Conduct for members of council and the application of any associated rules or procedures governing the ethical behavior of council members. So earlier this year, lower tier municipalities in Essex County uh, put out an RFP uh, for uh, integrity commissioner services that was issued back in July. And the submissions were evaluated by a committee of senior representatives from Amherstburg, Essex, LaSalle, and Tecumseh. 
And the members of that committee are recommended to their respective councils, and those councils have since now appointed Robert Swayze as their integrity commissioner. Mr. Swayze is a solicitor practicing in Caledon, Ontario. His practice has primarily been in municipal law. He's held senior positions, uh, including town and city solicitor in a number of municipalities over several years. And he's been appointed as the integrity officer or commissioner for nine municipalities, and I think that number has actually increased now. Um, as of January 1, 2016, and, and perhaps the reason that uh, municipalities are taking steps to appoint a, an integrity commissioner, uh, the powers of the Ombudsman under that legislation have been extended to municipalities. And this means that the Ombudsman may investigate any decision or recommendation made or any act done or omitted to have been done in the course of the administration of a municipality. There are some exceptions to the Ombudsman power in this regard as it does not extend to investigations of complaints regarding matters within the jurisdiction of an integrity commissioner. And there are certain exceptions to that rule as well. Uh, but at this point, it is the opinion of administration that the appointment of an integrity commissioner is an important step to ensuring the continued accountability, openness, and transparency of the municipality to its stakeholders and to the general public, and is recommending the appointment of Mr. Swayze to that role. Uh, the financial impact, uh, Mr. Swayze's proposal, uh, indicates that he does not charge a retainer fee for his services, but charges a fee of $280 per hour for any services performed, uh, plus ad additional mileage and some other uh, disbursements. Uh, it is not expected that Mr. Swayze would travel to Essex County. However, if that trip was necessary, those expenses would be incurred as well. His proposal indicates he is able to provide some value-added services, and it, that is one of the main reasons that the uh, recommendation is to appoint Mr. Swayze, rather than leaving any investigation uh, open to the Ombudsman. Those value-added services are that he can review Council's current Code of Conduct, provide any uh, recommendations for amendments to that Code of Conduct, provide uh, services such as training to Council on its Code of Conduct as well. And those services would be charged at the uh, same rate. Therefore, the recommendation is that Mr. Swayze be appointed as the Integrity Commissioner for the Municipality of Leamington uh, for the purposes of investigating and complaints related to the Code of Conduct and, if requested, providing any further advice to Council respecting the application of that Code of Conduct at the hourly rate of $280 for services performed plus any disbursements, and that the Mayor and Clerk be authorized to execute a retainer agreement for a term of two years. Thank you very much. Questions, comments from Council? Councillor Burbiki. Uh, thank you, Worthy Mayor. Just, to me, it's kind of scary to take this next step because uh, it almost seems like we have something wrong in our municipality that we need to, I know it's, you know, unlike other towns or stuff, uh, if you do sign this agreement, there is no cost at all, like, other than if he works on it. So when you're signing the agreement, retainer agreement, there's no, no fee. That's correct. There's no retainer fee as such. It's just on a fee for service. Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Your Worship. Ruth, can you take us through the process? Like, uh, how does this process work uh, that we notify this gentleman if needed? Is it something that we bring up a council to ask that we want to look into a matter? Or is it something that's done totally off in closed session? How's this done? If there is an investigation and, or a complaint, that complaint is directed to the integrity, integrity commissioner directly. So there's really no middle process, and that is actually to provide more accountability, more transparency, so that administration or other levels of, of the council process are not involved. The complaint is made directly to the integrity commissioner. So it's not only um, seen to be accountable, it's, it's also an accountability process, so there's no uh, indirect uh, um, actual 
delivery of the complaint. Okay, so does the, are we provided with, let's say, an email address or contact information for this gentleman? It doesn't come to you first, then you take us to there. It goes directly to this gentleman. Okay. Thank yes, you. and that can actually, when, what I would recommend is if he is appointed, that the code of conduct is uh, reviewed by uh, Mr. Swayze. He provides any recommendations, and within those recommendations, there may be additional processes that are laid out to specifically address those kinds of issues. Any other questions, comments? Councillor Hammond. Your Worship, thank you. I, uh, I almost um, hate to ask this question, but I'm going to anyway, because in light of the fact that I think it's going to be difficult for you to answer, but it, this gentleman's going to receive $280 an hour, and what can you anticipate the usage of that would be over the course of a year or a month? I mean, you already indicated that He's going to receive an email address, so in other words, if there were a complaint, and I'm assuming it's going to be a complaint with respect to conduct or something. So if it doesn't have to go through you, who regulates how much usage of this individual, Mr. Swayze, that's actually used? That is really, it could be up to council. My recommendation would be that the direct line be to the Integrity Commissioner because that's really his role, is to act as, as, count, as he reports to council, he doesn't report to administration. He is, because he's done this work for so long, he knows if a complaint is a, a viable complaint right at the beginning. He is obligated to investigate any complaint, but he also has the ability to determine if a complaint is, like I said, a viable complaint. And for that reason, I can see that it would be a very a nominal amount that council would be looking at paying for that service, for that fee for service. Um, I believe other municipalities have only budgeted for that nominal amount. And um, I believe we've had a code of conduct for a number of years. And to my knowledge, there's never been a complaint and yet that process is always open. Anybody can make a complaint based on a council member not uh, following his or her code of conduct. And to my knowledge, that hasn't happened since you've had one in place. So um, it's really also a public education process too. And administration can be involved in that public education process um, to advise the public as to what the role of the integrity, integrity commissioner is and is not. You're right. It's, it's an impossible question to answer because you never know. Uh, I, in, I think in the history of Leamington, we've had one complaint filed, and that was in our previous term, and that went to the ombudsman. And the ombudsman, much like Mr. Swayze, is very knowledgeable, or was in this instance, and he said this is not a legitimate complaint, and just it was just done. Um, anyway, I'll uh, go to the deputy mayor. Time. I was just going to say I think it's it's a good thing to keep us open and transparent. We have someone at our fingertips that we can call if there's an issue. And yes, we did have that one complaint in all the years that you were on and I've been on. We, we didn't have any other issues. So uh, again, it's not something that we're, we're flaming the, the path. This is done by other municipalities and, and there's been some homework done. So... To me, I have no problem with it. Keeps us open and transparent. So I would move the recommendation. Okay. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a support or seconder? Seconder by Councillor Jacobs. Councillor Verbeke. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I will not be supporting this as written because I think we're going to be on a wild goose chase unless there's some accountability for Joan or John Q. Public out there. They have to put some money up front too because. I think if they're going to complain that there should be a charge to them and if they're right they get the money back if not because we're just going to be our husband could be busy every day with somebody complaining about something so I, I think that should be also in the recommendation that there be a charge to whoever needs their services to in the public. Can that be a consideration? I mean what do they call that? There's a terminology for that but um for a complaint that has no frivolous. Uh, I, 
I can say that um, I believe one other local municipality has uh, charged a fee, and I did think about that. Um, I don't recommend it only because I think, um, in order again, you, to be account to be shown and seen as being accountable and transparent, you want to create as little as few barriers as possible. Um, I, I acknowledge your point. Uh, however, it may reduce the number of frivolous complaints. However, I would not want to be seen as putting up a barrier to a legitimate complaint being made. Not that I believe that there ever would be one. Um, but I think that's just another step that council takes in order to show that they are accountable and transparent to the public is putting up as few barriers as possible. Councillor Burpiki. Well, I just want to make sure that uh, Mr. Wilkinson gets his question answered first. Okay. I'm glad Larry brought that up, yes. I didn't realize that this was a service that the public can chime in on. I thought this was a service only for us councillors to use if we feel there's an issue amongst at the council table. Yeah, I'm totally, for the way uh, Larry has put it then, yes, I think uh, there does need to be some sort of a check there against the public if they are going to... If we decide to go with this, there absolutely has to be some sort of bill back to them. Absolutely. Okay, um, Councillor Jacobs and then Deputy Mayor. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, based on, on the last comments, so that we can monitor this, I think if it gets out of hand, we could look at it. But I sort of have to agree with our solicitor. I, I think if we start throwing some roadblocks or barriers up, you know, we're we're making it difficult for them to, act, to access us. And uh, yeah, I, I would hate to say, see that now, but I think if it got out of hand, if we have a complaint that's going in day after day after day, then we can look at that and then maybe change it at that time. Okay, Deputy Mayor. The public has always had the ombudsman to go to if with a complaint. And if you'll recall the last time, the one and only time that we've had a complaint, that gentleman, and I will say gentleman, didn't have the, um, what's the correct, politically correct terminology? The intestinal fortitude to leave his name. So really, people aren't going to do that because that makes them become public. Their name too would be public. And, and all these people that love to complain, rarely, rarely show their face with their words. I really don't think that you need to worry about that. Just given the history that we've had, we've never ever had that. So I, I don't think you have to be afraid of John Q. Public. And if John Q. Public has, a, has an issue, let the uh, Integrity Commissioner deal with it. I, I really don't think you need to worry about it. And again, to clear this, um, it, it really is just in regard to our code of conduct and procedural or just code of conduct? The integrity commissioner, it, it, the mandate of the integrity com commissioner and based on um, what the legislation has indicated or given the authority to the integrity commissioner or one that's appointed is just to investigate complaints related to code of conduct and ethical behavior of council members related to that code of conduct. That's the integrity commissioner. Now, as of January 1st, 2016, the ombudsman has these new right. wide-reaching yep. powers yep. that really relate to any decision or non-decision of council. Those are wide-reaching powers, but the integrity commissioner's mandate is limited just to complaints of code of conduct. Now, I think the ombudsman may be very busy on the other issues, and that's within the jurisdiction of the ombudsman. And, um, of course, with 444 municipalities and these new wide-reaching powers, um, that's going to be a very busy office. The integrity commissioner that we're recommending council appoint, though, the jurisdiction is very limited just to investigations regarding code of conduct. And the only reason I bring that up, because, uh, and I agree with both of you, that there could be those frivolous complaints on and on and on and on. But it'll always be just directed at our, our actions here under our code of conduct. So I'm not sure that that's going to be an over-abused situation in, in our instance anyway. So, Councillor Verbeke. Over the Mayor, on page 96, there B, it says the application of the code of conduct for members of council and or... So the application of uh, any procedures, rules, and policies is also underneath the Integrity Commissioner. 
So basically, it's just not the code of conduct. It's just the way we act. It's it's our it's procedure. procedure bylaws. Yes. I mean, so any, anything can be, you know, it's it's just it's. I've got nothing to hide, but I just I, I it's going to be it's going to be taxed too much. Well, I, I, you know, again, I I, I I know where you're coming from. I don't necessarily disagree. Actually, I didn't really want to support going to integrity commissioner, but I mean, why not? You know, there's no no real out, outside cost unless we have to use the person, but it's like an insurance policy. Um, anyway. Uh, I can I can just indicate uh, perhaps um, council can direct administration to uh, bring a report after six months that provides you with an idea of the number of complaints because we can get that information at any time and you can determine at that time if if it's um, a fee w is warranted after okay. after giving a, a look at the kind of the level of uh, busyness of that particular position. Okay. Councillor Wilkinson? You said that's a six-month option. Was there a one-year option offered? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd be more inclined to go along with the... I don't think we get a good window at six months. Uh, I'd be willing to go along with this, check it out after yeah. 12 months. I think so. Give it a ride. And bring it back and see how it, how it went. Okay. Uh, I can go with that. All right, so we do have a motion on the floor. Yes? Did we get a mover and seconder on that? We did. Right, okay. Questions? Do we need an amendment to it then if we're going to add a timeline? No, no, just a direction to admit. Councillor Rubiki? Just for the heck of it, worthy mayor, I'd like a recorded vote. Okay. Ms. Horton? All those in favor? Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Jacobs, Deputy Mayor McDonald, Councillor Hammond, Councillor Dunn, and the Mayor. Opposed? Councillor Verbicki. Motion carried. Okay. Moving on then, for matter, matters for approval, we have the minutes from the LinkedIn Accessibility Advisory Meeting held November 4th. Looking for a mover and seconder, Councillor Verbicki, Councillor Dunn. Discussion on that motion? All in favor? And carried. Uh, report on closed session. Ms. Horton? Yes, the council met in closed session commencing at 535 to consider matters pursuant to subsection 239.2 CD and F of the Municipal Act regarding uh, correspondence from Curry Law Professional Corporation, regarding a potential purchase of lands and a verbal report from the Chief Administrator as Administrative Officer regarding current labor negotiations. There were uh, procedural motions uh, passed at that uh, meeting, which was adjourned at approximately 6.04 p.m. That's a report of closed session. Thank you. Consideration of bylaws. There are a number of bylaws for consideration. I'm going to read the first one, uh, which is only for a third and final reading, and that is bylaw 369-14, being a bylaw to provide for the abandonment of the Dick Pumping Station in Part Lot 9, Broken Front Concession in the Municipality of Leamington in the County of Essex, and that is for third and final reading. So I'd ask for a motion on that particular bylaw first. Councillor Burbicki moves, support by Councillor Hammond. Okay, then I'm going to read two bylaws for first, second, and third reading, and that's bylaw 51815, being a bylaw to amend the comprehensive zoning bylaw 89009 for the Municipality of Leamington, which pertains to the subject land zoning bylaw holding symbol number 124, phase two destiny estates plan of subdivision, bylaw 524-15 being a bylaw to provide for a tariff of fees to be charged in 2016 by the municipality of Leamington. Again, those are for first, second, and third reading. Looking for a mover, Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Dunn. 
Next bylaw is 525.15, being a bylaw for the construction of a bridge over the Lundy Drain in Part Lot 12, Concession 9 in the Municipality of Leamington, the County of Essex. That's for a first and second reading only. A motion for that, please. Councillor Dunn moves. Councillor Verbeke seconds. And the last, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay. He's getting ready to vote. Okay, and bylaw 526. Dash 15 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Municipality of Leamington at its meeting held December 7th, 2015. Moved by the anxious Councillor Hammond and supported by Deputy Mayor. Um, discussion on those motions? All in favor? And carried. Thank you. Notice of motion. All right, so now this is the real time when this comes forward, correct? So the presenter may discuss why the present presentation is being made. So, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is regarding the request for peer review of the traffic engineer's report on Seacliff Drive and Bevel Line. The reason that I wanted to have a peer review of the engineer's report goes back to the original request to have the stop sign removed quite some time ago and at that time I believe the majority of council thought that it was a frivolous request and we denied it and then we started to get and, it, and I will add the traffic engineers or traffic study at the time had recommended it as well but some of us had differences of opinion on other points in that traffic report so we didn't hold it to probably the level that we could have but in the meantime we started getting letters emails and phone calls from residents who felt that we needed to have a, have the stop sign removed from the Seacliff Drive and Bevel line intersection and a number of those people have had doings with council that made us hold them in a higher estimation. They weren't frivolous, in other words. And so I asked if we could do something about looking at that again, whether it involved, a, <clears throat> excuse me, another study or, or what would the next move be. And I was told by administration that a peer review of the original report would be the most economical rather than doing it again. A number of us were concerned that because we went against the traffic engineer's report, we might be liable for lawsuits or, I guess, lawsuits if there, were, if there happened to be a, an accident with property damage or personal injury. So I, that's why I'm looking to have a request, or that's why I'm requesting a peer review of the engineer's report. Maybe a review, a peer review will give us another option. Maybe it'll say that we're fine with the stop sign there. I would just like to have another opinion. I guess that's basically what it is. It's like going for a second opinion to the doctor. So that's it. Okay, so this has already been moved and seconded, so we're just open for discussion on the motion. Hey everybody. Councillor Verbeke. And Worthy Mayor, thanks. I know it's, it's kind of early to, uh, to bring this up, but I guess we are going to be spending money and there is no projected cost of this yet from legal or anything. So, I mean, I guess once we, uh, once we say yay or nay to this, well, if we say yay, then we're, we're tied to possibly a hundred, two thousand, five thousand dollars. So uh, that's, you know, I, I would like to know maybe the estimate before or how you even go about this, but I think it, if we go this way, then we're going to have to pay it no matter what it is. Okay. Um, any comment from admin on uh, cost to do a peer review? Wild guess. Less than. What would the study have been in the first place? I don't uh, Mayor Patterson, this was a one recommendation that was incorporated into our uh, traffic, uh, our, our traffic master plan, essentially our short and long-term traffic plan. To look at this specific issue and the merits around it, a couple thousand dollars, a few thousand dollars. 
max. It's a very specific, very simple issue to yep. look at um, for a traffic engineer, so I don't anticipate it would be a, a large project. Okay. Councilor Rubicki? So we're the mayor for $2,000, and we already know what the result's going to be. Is it, is it, you know, we already know what they're going to say. I don't. Oh, wow. Okay. You want to bet? Well, as the deputy mayor alluded to, there may be other recommendations as to how we can handle it. So, uh, Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, lost my notes over here. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I don't want to put the, I'd rather not spend the money, whether it be 2000 bucks, whether it be $5,000. Um, I spoke against it before, but I am willing to re-listen to this argument again. And I would ask uh, Deputy Mayor McDonald and Larry, uh, Councillor Verbeke, would you be willing to re-listen to this argument again for it to come up in front of us and we discuss it again? And I, I pledge to give it the full respect it deserves and be open-minded to whatever arguments are there um, before we go and spend money on this peer review. There's a question, I guess, to Deputy Mayor McDonald and We're Councillor Verbeke. I'm not sure that I, I understand what you're saying. Right now, we're voting yay or nay tonight to go ahead with the peer review, yep. right? And I'm asking, uh, can we go in another direction? Could we just discuss this as a council instead? Um, yes. Re-listen to the matter again at the council table. I, I, well, I suppose you could, but uh, again, then we're relying on ourselves who are not licensed, educated traffic engineers to make a decision. Um, we, we had one traffic engineer do that for us. Council, as a majority, voted against that decision. Uh, we've had new information brought to light, which is kind of making several of us nervous. Um, and I think the proper step is to go back to the professionals to look at the professional and see if they were right or wrong or what other ideas there are. I, I'm not sure that we can, we can make that decision um, and, and feel comfortable about it. Mr. Neufeld? Uh, I think what Councillor Wilkinson might be suggesting is that um, the motion be brought back for reconsideration. The original motion based on the original uh, engineer's report, given where, where Council is at, if Council were to, um, and I know there's going to be some procedure here and, and uh, uh, Ms. Orton will or can lead us through that, but I, th I think that's what uh, Councillor Wilkinson is suggesting. Let's just Let's just bring the matter, the matter back for reconsideration based on the original engineer's report. And if, if, the, if council now is willing to accept that, I think we'd be done. And if council says no again, then we, we're in the same quagmire. That would be true. So. If I may, uh, I think we owe it, though, to the public to go down that road first. Exercise that option, that doesn't cost us nothing. The report has already been done one time. Bring it back, let's see where it goes. Councillor Jacobs. My question's been answered. Okay, Councillor Hammond. Thank you, um, you know, since we've, and we've talked about this issue quite, quite a lot, it's been a year now. But uh, I, along with uh, Councillor Wilkerson, uh, do not want to see this municipality spend any money at all on this review. Um, there are times when I think that you have to sit back and, and uh, whether it be as a councillor or whatever it is, and, and realize that maybe uh, either you made the wrong decision or based on the information you had at the time, you made the wrong decision. And I will suggest, too, that I'd like to see it brought forward again because... Um, I don't want to see us have to spend some money on what I believe a report will pretty much back up what the engineer's report uh, did a year ago at this point. So if there's a way of bringing this back to the table again, I'd like to see it done. Okay. Councillor Dunn. Through you, Your Worship. Uh, Peter, my question is regarding the liability. The original report came out that uh, if we remove the stop sign and the liability, they were recommending to remove the stop sign and the fact is that if somebody has, gets in an accident with the, the stop sign there, 
Are, is the municipality held for liability on that? Well, and I'm, I'm going to defer that to, uh, to Ms. Orton because she is the legal counsel. Well, it always depends on the facts. So um, the risk, though, is increased to the municipality to be found liable. Um, and certainly, uh, if you are acting for someone who is injured at that particular intersection and they're injured because of the confusion with the stop sign, you would certainly look and see how that stop sign came to be and all of the history related to how that stop sign came to be. And you would find the engineer's reports. And that would certainly um, attribute to the liability or the potential liability of the municipality in that case where there was the municipality had in its records a uh, report recommending the removal and yet council determined that um, they would not go in that direction. So that's the risk. It's an increased risk to the municipality because that report is there and because council didn't follow that particular recommendation. Further? Uh, further, uh, did we, I, uh, Deputy Mayor McDonald had mentioned that there's uh, a few residents have come forth regarding this issue. Um, quite a few, Sp to speaking to this uh, issue? A, a number that has made a certain level of discomfort arise amongst council members and admin especially. And th that the concern that the stop sign is going to create more accidents and the fact is along with what the original engineer's report was. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Jacobs. Thank you, Worship. Uh, in the event that the current motion on the table is voted down, do we have to go through the whole process to, as Councillor, excuse me, <coughs> Councillor Wilkinson has mentioned, go through the other process or could that be brought forward tonight or do we have to wait another, another notice I'll, of I'll ask for our solicitor's response to that so we kind of anticipated all of the possible <laughs> potential <laughs> issues that might arise tonight <laughs> you could do one of two things with the current notice of motion it can be withdrawn at the um, uh, if the uh, mover and seconder are agreeable to just simply withdraw the notice of motion or the motion that's currently on the floor or it can be voted on and if it's lost then council can um, make a motion to reconsider the original motion which was really to receive the report that was brought by Mr. Pilmer in 2014 so you can make a motion um, that whoever voted in favor to receive that report can make a motion to reconsider that decision to simply receive the report. And that only need be seconded by someone who was at that particular council meeting. So that could be anyone here except for Councillor Dunn. If that motion is on the floor, it is under our procedure bylaw, it is not to be considered at this evening's meeting unless council votes unanimously to consider it at tonight's meeting. The, that particular motion is only to reconsider the original motion. So you pass that motion, then the matter is before council. There has to again be a mover and seconder to actually on that motion to which would be to remove the stop sign. So your first step is really to decide what you're going to do with your notice of with the motion that's on the floor tonight. It can be withdrawn or it can be voted upon. That's the first step. It's up to you. It's your motion, Deputy Mayor. Well, Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to pull back on that. I feel like for us to have this conversation all over again would be ludicrous. It, it shows that we can't make up our minds and that we have to revisit issues time and time again, and I don't want to be known for being that. However, I don't find $2,000 to be 
a frivolous amount to spend for something that might save us the amount of a lawsuit. To me, it may, it may be money well spent to make sure that our decision is either correct, needs some adjusting, or is entirely incorrect. So to me, I'm going to stick with this, and if my fellow counselors don't agree with me, that's well and good. But I'm not, I will not vote to have this discussion all over again. Been there, done that. I'm not going to revisit it again unless there's a professional opinion. So not only um, to, to also comment on the fact that um, people already know the outcome, outcome, not only are we traffic engineers, we're also soothsayers and psychics. Okay, so... Um, Deputy Mayor, you have my support on that. I, I agree. My thinking, spending two two thousand dollars, if it's that much, to get a professional to either back up or dismiss our previous professionals' uh, report is the right way to go. I'm going to rest easier knowing that, and that's the purpose of a peer review. Um, so you know where I stand on that. But um, so we have a motion on the floor, and you've all heard. Um, either vote for or against, and, and we can go from there. Um, myself, I would encourage you to do this peer review. So, if there are no further comments on the motion, then I will call the vote. All those in favor of doing the peer review? Opposed? And motion carries. Okay. Open session. Anything from Council or admin? Councillor Rubiki. With the Mayor, before I start, uh, thanks, and I, I knew the outcome was going to be five to two, so I am psychic. <laughs> well, it was three to four. No. Uh, I, well, I want to give uh, thanks to the powers that be uh, for replacing the broken uh, park bench or the, the bus stop bench on Erie Street North. Uh, before the Santa Claus parade, I had uh, outside guests coming down uh, from out of town to uh, watch the parade with us, and they were impressed with the new seats. So I just want to give thanks to uh, the Board of Works, or Rob, or Ken, whoever did it, and thanks for putting it up on such short notice. Okay. Did I see some other hands yeah. go up under open session? Oh, Councillor Jacobs. And Thank you, Worship. Uh, if I could address this to uh, Rob, and we're on traffic studies. Markings for intersections <clears throat> where we have turn uh, lanes, and they're marked up and down the road, but then when you get right to the intersection, people are almost using them like a, a third lane to come up to the corner, and there's a lot of near misses, and I notice some of our intersections have a, a white line just prior to getting to the intersection that establishes that as a turn area rather than the whole length of the road. Could we look at some of those because I even got just about tagged yesterday, actually, on Sea Cliff and Erie at that one. So, thank you, Mayor Patterson. And yes, um, certainly, perhaps after the meeting, uh, I'll get a better understanding of specifically what you're referring to. I think what you're saying is when the, there's a third center lane and it's for a turn lane in either direction, but people are grabbing it and flying down. So uh, I'll get a, an appreciation for what you're talking about, and then I'll, I'll chat with the other uh, guys in engineering about it. Okay. Councillor Hammond. Your Worship, thank you. Uh, a couple of things. Um, I think it should be noted. I was going to do it while she was here, uh, and that's uh, thank and congratulate Wendy Parsons and the entire chamber on hosting and putting on the Christmas parade. They did a fantastic job uh, again this year. And further to that, and I think little... Uh, Little thanks ever goes out, but our Board of Works, uh, the gentlemen and the ladies that worked on that float for uh, carrying our Santa Claus, you know, they, they take a lot of pride in doing that, and they, they should be thanked for it, because I know they work a couple of days on putting it together, and they do a fantastic job. Thank you very much. Anything from staff, admin? Nothing? All right. So we'll move on to announcement of upcoming meetings. Wednesday, December the 9th, Leamington Accessibility Advisory Committee at 3 p.m. in the West End Boardroom. Monday, December 14th, Council meeting 6 p.m. here in Council Chambers. Statement of members non-debatable. Motion to adjourn. Oh, wow. Everybody.
councillor dunn and councillor hammond all in favor of that motion and carried.